if for no other reason than to see this fantastic room. Um, I've driven by here obviously a thousand times with never knowing what was inside. But it's the treasures on yonder wall are remarkable. And it was an uh, enormous pleasure too to get to just to have an excuse to drive up Middlebury Gap from home near Breadloaf and uh, in the dusk the yellows were really popping and then to come down into this most beautiful narrow steep shouldered valleys and, and um, a real gorgeous day all of which makes it um, the more worse that my uh, basic task in life is just to bump people out <laughs> um, so I apologize in advance um, and I actually will try to end on a more upbeat note, but I, you know, um, it strikes me that the most useful thing to do maybe is just bring people a little bit up to date on where we are on climate change. Um, I know that you've been paying attention the last few weeks and watching the wonderful uh, saga of you know Greta and the young people uh, at work, and I'll tell you some stories about that. I've had to spend a fair amount of time with her in the last few weeks and things, but the um, the and, and there's much good news in all of that. But the basic underlying news is, is, is pretty bad. Um, June of this year was the hottest June we've ever recorded on planet Earth. July was the hottest month period we've ever recorded on planet Earth. August was the second hottest August we've ever recorded. September was the hottest September ever recorded on this planet. Um, and we're seeing the effects of it now, you know, daily uh, uh, around the world in ways I don't really need to tell you about. Um, I will say that there's a kind of dystopian uh, uh, cast, sort of uh, uh, shadow cast increasingly over parts of the world. I, I read to see things as I was coming out of a report on the news that uh, Pacific Gas and Electric in California is shutting off power to 30 counties of the 58 counties in California because it's so hot and so dry and the wind is coming up that they're afraid that their power lines will spark another fire like they did last year when a city literally called Paradise literally turned into hell inside half an hour. So um, let me let me begin there just by showing you a few pictures just to kind of set things in a larger context. Can I just hit a, hit a button there and we'll get, we'll get this tiny view to These are from a trip last summer I took uh, uh, to Greenland for a particular reason. Uh, but the first reason was just to see Greenland, which is truly amazing and remarkable. Let's see another thing that's not here. Um, it is, as you know, the great storehouse of ice in our hemisphere. The ice across the biggest island in the world uh, it just covers almost all of it, often to depths of more than a mile. So to see it is spectacular, this ice sheet. Uh, and to see it start to melt is, is pretty ominous. And it is melting wherever you go. Um, there's it's no small matter. Greenland alone has 23 feet of sea level rise in the ice that's on Greenland, never mind the Antarctic or, or anywhere else. So I was there. Uh, you, get a sense, you get a sense of how fast it's melting. Uh, I don't know if you can see this or not. This was this boat that I chartered for the expedition that I'll describe in a minute. And as you can see out the front of the boat, there's uh, blue fjord as far as you can see in every direction. But I was standing behind the captain's wheel and looking up at his electronic chart, and you can see that the black cursor that denotes the boat in which we're traveling appears to be a mile or so onto solid land. And I, I pointed this out with some mild trepidation to the captain. <laughs> um, and he just laughed and said, oh, the chart's five years old. Five years ago, this was ice as far as you can see, but now it's all open. Um, um, I was going there because I wanted to take this woman, uh, Captain Jetnil Kajiner, up on the ice sheet. She's a poet from the Marshall Islands in the South Pacific. 
The Marshall Islands are a remarkable place. People have been living there for many thousands of years, but the highest point in the whole atoll is about a meter above sea level. Uh, it was a hard place to be in the last century because the Marshalls was where Bikini Atoll was that we exploded the first big age bomb on. Um, and it's still, you can't get anywhere near it. But now it's a hard place to be because a meter is way too low on a rapidly warming planet, okay? So I want to encourage her to be able to deliver one of her poems, which are really remarkable, while she was standing on the ice that when it melted would drown her home. And she recruited the other woman, Aka Viviana, who's a Greenlandic native young woman, uh, whose you know, homeland is disappearing in, in her eyes. And together, the, the poem that they produced was really quite uh, remarkable. Um, you can see it on YouTube. Millions and millions of people have watched it now. Um, um, so it was powerful, and I'm glad we did this. But it was startling, i got to say, just to see that this is, is Pointed out sideways, so this may be, may be hard to watch. Um, 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 it's just filmed from my, you can maybe get a sense of this, it. just filmed, you can close your eyes and start to see it. Um, it's just filmed from my cell phone camera in the front of the helicopter. Uh, uh, we were just been changing the batteries in one of these instruments that records the recision of the glaciers, and we were flying back over it. It'll take a minute for you to see why I bothered to shoot this video. But, um, Suffice it to say, when you're in Greenland, you are struck by the fact that climate change is by far the biggest thing that human beings have ever done. By orders of magnitude, the biggest thing that as a species we've ever done is change the chemistry of the planet's atmosphere and hence its temperature. Um, uh, it's actually quite hard to see. <laughs> but uh, in a minute, I mean, this is the front of the ice sheet headed back toward the glacier, and it's much higher than it looks. It's about 120 feet high, so that's a, you're looking at the kind of face of a 12-story building there. Um, and in a minute, we're going to see a little, well, actually, a not so little 12-story building just start crumbling um, into the sea. Keep your eye on the far top there in a minute. Um, and the thing to realize is, that this, you have to kind of turn your head um, uh, so Those waves are 60, 70, 80 feet high. Um, uh, it was a great deal of sinister beauty watching this crash into the fjord. But just to realize that this is happening someplace in the frozen parts of the planet now, every second, of every minute, of every hour, of every day. And each time it happens, the ocean rises some tiny fraction of a millimeter, but all in all, it's changing the world we live in in the most dangerous and, and really incredible ways. Half the summer sea ice in the Arctic is gone now. Uh, the ocean itself that you're looking at, and all the world's oceans are about 30% more acidic than they were 40 years ago because they're absorbing carbon from the atmosphere. Uh, you know, the biggest Living structures on the Earth are, are the Great Barrier Reef is literally the biggest living structure on the planet. It's half as living as it was three or four years ago because it's bleached very dramatically. And um, before we get seasick, let's just <laughs> turn that um, um, The change is astonishing, and What's really scary is we're still relatively near the beginning, not the end of this process. We've raised the temperature of the Earth one degree Celsius so far, uh, and that's accomplished all the things that I've described. That's why the Arctic is melting. That's why California burns. That's you know, that's why storms like Irene can drop more rain on Vermont than have ever dropped in its history, uh, uh, with the results that you all know too well. Um, um, that's with one degree Celsius, uh, 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Even if we kept the promises, all the countries in the world kept the promises that they made in Paris, the temperature of the Earth would still rise about three degrees Celsius, six or seven degrees Fahrenheit. And of course, some of the nations of the world have, one of the nations of the world has decided not even to pretend to keep the promises that it made in Paris.
Paris. Uh, 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 we have to do much better than that, much more quickly, if we have any chance of a world in which civilizations like the ones that we currently enjoy will be able to survive. They can't deal with a, a temperature three degrees Celsius, four degrees Celsius higher. It's just too hot. Um, in fact, literally too hot. Over the last uh, couple of summers, we've seen the highest reliably recorded temperatures ever on planet Earth. Um, it got over last summer and then the summer before, there are a series of cities across uh, parts of the Middle East and the Asian subcontinent, the temperature reached uh, above 129 degrees Fahrenheit. So the next time it's, next summer when it's 89 and you're complaining about, you know, maybe thinking you need an air conditioner in Rochester or something, try to imagine it 40 degrees hotter. In fact, in some of those cities in the Persian Gulf, it was simultaneously so humid that the heat index was about 160 degrees. Um, 129 degrees, human beings can live for a few hours, but after that, your body can't cool down fast enough to keep ahead. If the temperature of the planet goes up three degrees Celsius, then, <coughs> then there are going to be huge swaths of the planet across the subcontinent, the North China Plain, and much of the Persian Gulf, where those temperatures will be common for weeks each year, uh, and people really won't be able to live there anymore. The UN estimates that um, we'll see a billion climate refugees in the course of this century. So you saw what a million refugees coming out of Syria did to the politics of Western Europe. You've seen what a million refugees on the southern border, many of them climate refugees fleeing the drought in Honduras and Guatemala, have done to dislocate the politics of the United States. Now multiply that by a thousand and try to imagine the planet that results. <laughs> you know? So the, the, the goal has got to be extremely rapid reaction to the crisis that we now are in. Not a future crisis, but a present crisis. Extremely rapid in hopes of not stopping climate change, but of stopping it short of what it would otherwise get to. And here, we actually have some good news. At least the prospect, the possibility of change is here in a way that it wasn't say a decade ago. Over the last decade, the engineers have really done their job. The price of solar panel or wind turbines dropped about 90% in that period, to the point where it's now the cheapest way to generate power over most of the earth. And that means that if we wanted to move with extraordinary haste, um, we probably could at this point. The other thing that's happened over the last five years is that the engineers have dramatically dropped the cost of storage batteries for power. Uh, uh, so that now the fact that the sun goes down at night or the wind sometimes ceases to blow is less of an issue than it used to. The city of Los Angeles last week signed a new contract with it. There will be a new solar farm with storage batteries on the edge of Los Angeles to provide 8% of that city's power the cost is about two cents a kilowatt hour, which is cheaper than anyone's generated power on this continent before. Um, so that's a very good sign, very good possibility. The problem, of course, is that we're not moving with anything like the speed we need to to take advantage of that. We can't just wait for it to happen solely out of kind of economic principles, because it will take way too long. Yes, 75 years from now, the planet will run on sun and wind because it's cheap. But if it takes 75 years to get there, the planet that runs on sun and wind will be a broken planet. So the job is to make things happen much more quickly than they otherwise would. And the reason that they're not, most profoundly, and this took me a long time to realize, and we can talk about it later if you want, but the reason that we're not moving with the speed we should is mostly because of the extraordinary power of the fossil fuel industry 
and their willingness to, well, to do what it takes to keep their business model going, even at the cost of breaking the planet. That sounds hyperbolic, and I wouldn't have said it that way even four or five years ago, because I try not to exaggerate error, but great investigative reporting over the last few years from places like the Los Angeles Times and the Columbia Journalism School, going in, talking to whistleblowers, digging through archives, has established beyond any doubt that the big oil companies knew everything there was to know about climate change in the 1980s. They had huge science departments. They were the richest companies on Earth. Their product was carbon. Of course they were going to investigate and find out what was going on. Exxon, they found in the archives, uh, uh, graphs that the scientists presented to the executives that showed with spot-on accuracy what the temperature and the carbon concentration in the atmosphere would be in 2020, you know, exactly where we are. Um, and the scientists were believed. I mean, Exxon literally began building all its drilling rigs higher to compensate for the rise in sea level that they knew was coming, okay? They didn't, of course, tell any of the rest of us. Instead, they invested billions of dollars in building this kind of architecture of deceit and denial and disinformation uh, that, well, that, that kept us locked in a completely phony debate for 30 years about whether or not global warming was real. Uh, a debate that both sides knew the answer to at the beginning, it's just one of them was willing to lie about. And it turns out to be the most consequential lie probably in human history uh, because it cost us that 30 years that we would otherwise have been at work. Um, and I mean, I, I don't know what more to say about that really, except that it became clear to me. Uh, I wrote the first book about climate change 30 years, came out 30 years ago this month, a book called The End of Nature. And I spent 15 years thinking that my job was to write more books and so on. And eventually, the weight of evidence would, you know, we'd carry the argument and so on. At a certain point, it just became clear to me that we won the argument. We were just losing the fight, because the fight wasn't about evidence. It was about money and power. And so it was time to try and build some power of our own. And that process began uh, in many ways, you know, um, for in, in the western side of Vermont. Um, um, there's people here who remember that first march that we did in 2006 that began in Ripton and ended in uh, Burlington five days later. The uh, uh, first march for the climate, uh, we had no idea what we were doing, but there was a, uh, you know, there was a story in the free press the day we got there with a thousand people that that had been the largest demonstration that had yet taken place in the United States about climate change. So when we read that, we were like, okay, no wonder we're losing. You know, we have everything you'd need for a movement, you know, Al Gore and policy experts and scientists and so on. The only part of the movement we've left out is the movement part. We just need people. And so we began trying to do it. And the, and, and the vehicle at first was this thing called 350.org that I formed with seven undergraduates at Middlebury in 2008. And it took its odd name from the number that's really the most important number in the world, 350 parts per million CO2. The scientists had just established it that year as the kind of safe upper bound for carbon in the atmosphere. Of course, we're way past that upper bound now. We're about 415 parts per million going up about three parts per million per year. That's why we're in the trouble we're in, okay? Um, but the number was good, and it was good in part because it allowed us to, in Arabic numerals, to think about organizing globally, which is what we started thinking about, you know? There were seven undergraduates. There are seven continents. Each one took one, we got to work, all right? The guy who took the Antarctic also had to take the internet. And, and off we went. And these are pictures from the first day of global action uh, in 2009, so 10 years ago this month. And um, I'll show them to you. 
because I want you to sort of see the baseline now against which to judge the wonderful images of the last few weeks from around the world. This was the first attempt at this, and it was uh, uh, on this day of action, we'd ask people to gather wherever they, you know, wherever we've been able to locate them around the world, and they did. There were 5,200 demonstrations in 181 countries. CNN called it the most widespread day of political action in planet's history. Most of them were fairly small. Uh, some of them very small. Uh, but all of them very beautiful and spirit. One of the things that became very clear watching the pictures roll in was that I had always been told that environmentalism was something that rich white people did. And if you didn't know where your next meal was coming from, you wouldn't be an environmentalist or whatever. It just turned out to be nonsense. Uh, um, you know, it turned out that almost everyone we were working with around the world was poor, black, brown, Asian, young. Because that's what almost everybody in the world is. Okay. And, and they were exactly as concerned as anybody else about climate change, maybe more so because the future really bears down hard on you if you're in places like that. So people brought their wings there, you know, wherever they were. Uh, uh, this was the first time there was big religious involvement in this place. They had a Muslim in South Africa, indigenous traditions, the Anglican Archbishop behind them there. Uh, you know, uh, that's too many barriers in the way, but that's Jordan and Palestine and Israel cooperating on this day. And, uh, you know, we did 200 big demonstrations in China, which isn't easy, and a couple of them got broken up by the police and people arrested. China's doing remarkable things now on energy. They're installing renewable energy faster than any place on, on, on the planet. Um, those are your brothers and sisters in the Maldives, just demonstrating the existential problem that comes when you're that close to the water. Uh, again, in the Maldives and the Indian Ocean, the highest point's maybe two meters above sea level. So this 5,000-year-old paradise probably won't make it through the century. But they're fine. Um, there were a bunch of pictures that ended up in the final arms, 350 adorable. And they were adorable, and they were also hard to look at. I mean, those kids are going to be refugees, and not because of something they did, but because of stuff we did. So we've, you know, we've done, we've done about 20,000 demonstrations around the world that have kind of laid the groundwork for uh, what comes now. You know, and it's been wonderful, fun work to do all over the planet in places we didn't know, in places we got to know. You know, we've got these giant art projects, and we've been. Uh, it's, it's, that was one of my favorite images from this art day that we did all over the planet. We borrowed a satellite to take images on because they were so big. It's one of those dry riverbeds in the southwest. The Santa Fe Art Institute got about 3,000 people out in that arroyo. And when the satellite came over, they just put blue blankets up over their head for a second to kind of drive the river back to life a little bit as an art project. If we had 50 years, this is the kind of work we would just keep doing. Because, you know, human beings work best when they change in kind of slow and generational ways. It's the cheapest, least traumatic way. We don't have 50 years. The oil industry wasted the last three decades for us. So now we've got to move with way too much speed. So, you know, in addition to education, we do a lot of confrontation now. Um, and this was the pictures seven years ago from the start of the first big civil disobedience around climate change uh, in uh, D.C. over the Keystone Pipeline. Um, I, uh, uh, when we started, people said there was no possible way we could win. Uh, uh, the oil industry had never lost a fight like this. National Journal, the trade paper in D.C., Hold its 300 energy insiders uh, on Capitol Hill. They said that TransCanada would have its permit by the end of 2011 for this. Um, after four years of hard work, including some by people in this room, uh, Barack Obama said, no, we won't grant you a permit, uh, uh, which was a huge victory, the first time we were uh, Donald Trump, on his first day in office, signed a piece of paper re-granting the permit for this pipeline. He labors under the impression that it's already been built because he keeps announcing it in speeches and things. But in fact, it has not yet. Uh, TransCanada still has been unable to uh, raise the money, and they're scared of the opposition. I was extraordinarily happy today to see pictures from uh, the Midwest of um, Greta Thunberg and a woman named, a woman her age, 
great, uh, another 16-year-old named Dakota Iron Eyes, uh, Lakota Sioux, uh, at, at the head of a big procession uh, uh, tr uh, protesting plans for the Keystone Pipeline. Those two girls I mean, were still in diapers when this fight started, you know, and now they're at the forefront of it. It's been wonderful to watch. More importantly, you know, what happened as it uh, went along was that people saw you could fight everything. And so they did, and there hasn't been in the years since a pipeline, a frack well, a coal mine, an LNG terminal that's been built without extraordinary opposition. Sometimes, in fact, a lot of the time, a surprising amount of the time, we win these fights. Even when we don't, we win because we slow them down, delay them, raise the price of what they're doing, and every month that that happens, the engineers drop the price of the solar panel another percent or so, and the spreadsheet gets a little harder for them to justify. There are times when we get started too late. The gas pipeline from Burlington down to Middlebury was a perfect example. Um, you know, it's not going to go past Middlebury now, I'm pretty sure. Um, so that was a winning part, but not a whole. Often we're able to stop things. Whether we've stopped any of this in time, as I said earlier, is a very hard question to know. And I can show you pictures all day from people around the world. Uh, I mean, these are people in Siberia. We now have forest fires four, five, six degrees of latitude north of where we've ever seen them before. There's extraordinary reporting in the Washington Post this week about what's going on in Siberia as the permafrost melts. Um, it's terrible. It's making it impossible for people to do anything up there except the one kind of growth industry um, is people uh, 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 stumbling through the melting permafrost trying to find woolly mammoth tusks as they file so they can sell them to the Chinese as aphrodisiacs. Um, um, I mean, that's a kind of dystopian picture of the world on which we live. So we don't know if we're in time, but we know that that those, those people are leaving their homes in Micronesia because it's already too hot. But that top red balloon is where the Dead Sea was 45 years ago. Um, I mean, these are your brothers and sisters in Pakistan, and you should be able to identify with this given what Rochester went through. These guys were in a part of Pakistan that in 2010 had the worst flooding since Noah. I mean, it rained so hard the way it can only rain on a globally warmed world. Warm air holds more water vapor than cold. So the, just the potential for rainstorms is the, the upper bound is much higher than it used to be. Well, these guys have rained so hard in Pakistan that the Indus River swelled to it covered about 25% of the country. 20 million people were out of their homes. So basically everybody from Boston to Baltimore had to be evacuated, okay? Um, um, and if you look at them, you instantly recognize the iron law of climate change, which is the less you did to cause it, the more and the sooner you suffer from it, okay? Uh, this is not these guys' fault in any sense of the word. Um, and you know, that's why it's so important to kind of well, sort of bear in mind that, that golf all the time. I just said, put this picture in the other day just for two reasons. It's a small, unimportant demonstration of a small provincial city on that peninsula down in the southwest of Haiti. Um, it's in there for two reasons. One, the year later, uh, a much bigger hurricane than the one of this day uh, uh, swept through that part of the world, the biggest hurricane they'd ever had, and it wiped out that city. 80% of the buildings were gone. I have no idea if this is just a lot. Okay? The other reason I think is that there's signs always just struck me. It says, your actions affect me, which is really true. I mean, the reason they had a huge hurricane is, you know, we've put so much carbon in the atmosphere that the ocean is hotter than it used to be, and that's how hurricanes, that's where they get their power, okay? Your actions affect me, but not vice versa. I mean, there's nothing they can do to alter this story. Um, they can't use less fossil fuel. They aren't using any to speak of now. They can't come to the White House and protest, we would actually don't let Haitians come into the country, much less for the purpose of protesting. Uh, they can't sell their stock portfolio. 
okay? Because I guarantee you that there's more, you know, stock portfolio in the retirement savings in this small room than in that entire province of Haiti, okay? Uh, uh, that's the stuff that we have to do. That's one of the reasons that we launched this huge divestment campaign six years ago. And when we started, it wasn't huge at all, it was small. Uh, the effort was simply to get institutions to begin selling their stock in coal and gas and oil companies on the theory that that would send a powerful signal that it wasn't okay what they were doing, um, that their business plan was incompatible with, you know, continued existence of the planet in its current form. When we started, we had no idea how well it would go. It turns out to have gone very well indeed. It's now the biggest corporate campaign of its kind in history. We had a kind of party two weeks ago in New York to celebrate the fact that we'd gone past the $11 trillion mark in endowments and portfolios that have divested their holdings. Two weeks ago, the University of California system divested its $80 billion endowment and pension fund from fossil fuels. Partly, this, we, we've had this enormous success because people are waking up to climate change and don't want to be on the wrong side for moral reasons. Probably more importantly, it's become incredibly clear that those who were divesting from fossil fuel were making more money than those who weren't because the fossil fuel sector has been dramatically underperforming the rest of the economy, which is no surprise because, as I said earlier, it has, you know, it's the sector of our economy that faces an enormous technological challenge from uh, a new technology, sun and wind, that's cheaper and cleaner. So it's not surprising that it's lagging, and that's one of the reasons that people are divesting. But it's been really powerful to watch. Uh, Ten days ago, I stood up on a stage in New York City with Mary Powell, the CEO of Green Mountain Power in Vermont, when she announced that they were divesting the utilities pension fund, the first time that that's happened any place in the world. That was a really remarkable announcement. It also, for me, as a Vermonter, put in pretty stark relief the fact that our state treasurer has adamantly refused to divest the state employees' pension fund for a decade now. Beth Pierce has refused to take any action, and as a result has lost Vermonters' money, but also slowed down this process. Similarly, the University of Vermont, whose board of trustees is appointed by the legislature and the governor, has refused to take any action. These are important things that it might be worth writing a letter or two to Montpelier about just to kind of try and make your voice heard. There's going to be a lot more work forthcoming around these questions around finance. That's what I'm going to be spending the next few years doing. Greta and her crew, have, young people, have asked adults to join and join hard, which is appropriate. Um, happy as I am to see them part of work, there is something highly undignified about putting the biggest problem the world has ever faced on the shoulder of junior high school students. Okay. So one of the things we're going to be doing, and I just wrote a big piece for The New Yorker about this, is trying to figure out how to take this divestment thing to the next ring and go after the banks that are funding the fossil fuel companies. Um, the biggest of them, banks like, well, Chase is the biggest of them all. Chase has dramatically increased its fund lending to the fossil fuel industry in the three years since the Paris Climate Accords. They've spent $196 billion in the last three years financing, which means they're in many ways a bigger carbon giant than Exxon or Chevron or anybody else. And, you know, it's hard for us to completely stop using fossil fuel, um, just given the, you know, if there's no, if the train doesn't come where you are, it's hard to take the train, okay? But it's easy, relatively, for everybody to take their chase card out of their wallet at the appropriate moment and cut it in half and find somebody else that's, you know, not doing that. So stay tuned. We're going to give you all the information you need uh, in, in order to do things like that. Let me just finish by saying, you know, show you a few more pictures. Just to say, there really is a powerful resistance now around the world. And it's beautiful to see. These are pictures from not this last uh, we in New York last month, and there were 
250,000. This is 400,000 people in 2014 in what was, uh, until last month, the biggest climate march in the planet's history. Uh, it was very beautiful. And there were other things going on that same week around the world. Um, the ones I want to show you come from our, my favorite colleagues from 315 in the South Pacific. Um, um, <coughs> that same week that we were marching in New York, these guys were um, they, on each of these islands, nations, Vanuatu, Tuvalu, the Marshalls, Micronesia, the Solomons, all these places that are in, in literal hot water. Um, um, they each cut down a tree on their islands and made a traditional canoe. And they took them off to Newcastle in Australia, so in their part of the world. Uh, Newcastle, Australia is the biggest coal port in the world. More coal moves through it than any place on the planet. And so for a day, they used these canoes to blockade the biggest ore ships in the world and keep them in harbor. It was a very powerful symbolic witness. Uh, in fact, a month later, the Newcastle City Council, remember, biggest coal port in the world, voted to divest its pension funds from fossil fuels. So, you know, bear that in mind when we think about why Vermont hasn't gotten around yet to go in. Okay. Um, but I want to show it to you just because I'm a, you know, I'm a writer by trade, and so I know that there are kind of a few sort of tropes that live in the human imagination. Um, and the, one of the most powerful of those tropes is uh, the kind of battle between the small and the many against the mighty and the few. Okay? So this is, you know, this is the Israelites and Pharaoh, you know? Um, this is the rebel alliance and the death squad, okay? And once you start seeing that, you see it, you know, everywhere. That was that same summer in Seattle. That 40 story monolith there is a drill rig that Shell Oil had hired to go up and open the Arctic for the first time to oil drill. Think about that for a minute. Uh, scientists had carefully explained that if we kept burning coal and gas and oil, we would melt the Arctic. We kept doing all those things, the Arctic melted. Uh, did Shell Oil say maybe we should go into a different business like solar panels? No. They said, now that it's melted up there, it'll be easier to drill for more oil. Let's hire a big rig and go up there and find out. So, uh, which, you know, like, that's, I mean, caught. Was the big brain a good evolutionary adaptation? I don't know. I mean, I mean happily, there are lots of people with reasonable sized brains attached to large parts who got in the way. Um, and now uh, canoes by the thousands of blockade this thing in. We called them, of course, kayaktivists. Um, and, and they did their job. It took them a week. Shell finally, after a week, got a Coast Guard cutter to you know, get them all out of the way and allow this thing to go. But by that time, the damage had been done. The shell essentially threw in the towel. They just said, we cannot deal with endless pictures of, of people in kayaks uh, you know, somehow trying to block us. Uh, you know, we've spent $9 billion on this project, but no more. This damage is too much, so we're, we're done. And that was a big victory, and we've had a lot of victories like that. But basically, it demonstrates what this fight is. The small and the many against the mighty and the few. And, and we don't know how it's going to come out. Uh, the only thing I would say to you, guys, is um, we know that we're not doing well right now. You know? We know that because the planet is way, way, way outside its comfort zone. Um, the heat that the the carbon that we put in the atmosphere so far is trapping each second the equivalent of about four, or the heat equivalent of about four Hiroshima-sized bombs, okay? That's why the Arctic, that's where the heat comes from to melt the Arctic and do all these other things. The planet's outside its comfort zone, so we probably should be somewhat outside our comfort zone, too. Um, whatever we've done so far on this hasn't been enough. And so, I'm not, I don't know exactly what 
you know, you need to do to be outside your comfort zone. I, I know it's been an interesting experience this last decade or so for me. I've found myself, uh, you know, in jail a number more times than it occurred to me it would ever happen to me, um, and things like that. Um, and I'm happy to see today that around the world there were thousands of people blocking streets in big cities in Europe and things as part of this Extinction Rebellion. And, and I, I don't know quite what it's going to take, but we better get things moving faster than we're moving now. We are literally out of decades to waste fooling around on this. Um, yes, it would be nice to be able to go very slowly and to, you know, uh, 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 let the state treasurer take as long as it feels comfortable to do, but we're not in that place anymore. We have to move fast. Um, and I will add one last thing, just looking at the demographics of this room. <laughs> um, um, it's true that young people are in the lead, but it's also true that they're calling on us to join them. Uh, I remember writing the um, writing the letter asking people to come to Washington to get arrested at the start of that fight over the Keystone Pipeline, and it was a hard letter to write. Uh, but one of the things I said in it was, I don't think in this case that young people should actually have to be the cannon fodder. If you're 19, then an arrest record might not be the best thing for you. Past a certain point, <laughs> what the hell are they going to do? And so it was with pleasure that I watched people, you know, with airlines like mine arriving in Washington. Now we did not ask people when they were getting arrested, how old are you? That would be rude. But we did cleverly, I think, say, who was president when you were born? And the two biggest cohorts were from the FDR and the Truman administration. And on the last day, there was a guy arrested. The last guy arrested, number 1254, had a sign around his neck that said, World War II vet, nimble with care. He was so old, he'd been born in the Warren Harding administration, which was so old, I'd forgotten there was a Warren Harding administration. And so, it, you know, it was really good for young people who were there to see their elders act in the way that elders actually need to act in a working society. Um, that's one of the reasons I wrote that kind of funny novel, uh, Radio Free Vermont, a couple years ago, because I was one of the points that I wanted to sort of try and bring out. Um, um, this is not a fight like other fights, because we don't know how it's going to come out. Uh, other fights, we've been relatively sure that if we kept at them long enough, we'd win. Dr. King, would say at the end of speeches, he'd say, quoting, I think, from the Massachusetts abolitionist Theodore Parker, he'd say, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. This may take a while, but we're going to win. The arc of the physical universe is short, and it bends toward heat. If we don't win soon, then we won't win. So that's the challenge. That's the urgency. Amidst all the other crazy things going on in the world, this is the most important thing that's happening every day on our planet, and we've got to figure out some of it politically, and some of it by changing the power that lies in political institutions, and some of it by changing the power that lies in financial institutions. We've got to figure out how to move faster than we're moving now. So that's that's what I got. I'm sorry that it's a little depressing, um, um, but I actually am also kind of hopeful right now. It really was fun to be, uh, uh, 350.org sort of served as the logistical backbone for all the youth climate strikes that, uh, over the last couple of months. And so I really got to work closely with a bunch of people. And, and with Greta in particular, who turns out to be just a wonderful human being, uh, who's taken her autism, her Asperger's syndrome, which she talks about quite freely, and turned it into a kind of superpower because she is enormously focused and unworried by the kind of endless attacks that come her way every day from uh, you know, the obvious people in our society. Um, and I enjoyed, most of all, here I really will end with this story. Uh, I went down to Washington with her uh, just to kind of stand by while she was testifying before the House uh, Committee on House Committee, I'm talking about things, I, some House Committee. Um, 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 and, 
And, we, and she began beautifully. They, uh, they, you know, they, the members, the ranking member, and the second ranking member, things all gassed on for five, five whatever their five minute allotment was. And they finally said, and now Mrs. Thunberg, or Ms. Thunberg, what's your testimony? And she said, oh, I'm, I'm not here to testify. I'm just here to deliver this report from the world scientists and hand them the latest IPCC reports. I think you should read it. And they were sort of flummoxed by that. But then they started at, you know, asking questions. And the, the lead Republican went on this five-minute tirade about uh, China this, China that, China produces more carbon, blah, blah, blah. There were lots of easy ways, she, you know, statistics she could have used to answer it. You know, China's actually reducing its carbon emissions now, unlike the U.S. China's building more renewable energy than Earth, anyone on Earth. In per capita terms, China produces a fraction of what Americans do on and on. But much more wisely, she just, she said very kindly, and she's <laughs> yay tall, and maybe weighs 70 pounds. With a duck this guy said, well, oh, sir, I come from a small country named Sweden. And in Sweden, sometimes people say, why should we do anything? Because the United States is so big and waste so much. Just so you know, she said. That <laughs> <laughs> made me very happy. And I, I've, 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 I've consoled myself with it whenever I've gotten depressed since. So many thanks for coming. And if you've got uh, questions or comments or or abuse or anything else. <laughs> I'm more than happy to. I, I teach physics at Vermont Tech, a college for a year. And I spend a lot of time on climate change. And I, I also um, have 183 kilowatts of photovoltaics on my land, supplying 38 families. I get all my energy except for my propane cook stove, which I can't figure out how to replace, um, from the sun. I have a Tesla, I charge that on photovoltaics. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the one thing about when, you know, talk about 30 years ago, um, we didn't have the technology at the right price to really probably have done anything then. Um, and now we do. Now, it's, as you mentioned, it's cheaper. I have a couple of Tesla power walls. You know, I can run for seven days without being connected to the grid between that and my photovoltaics, which th allows them to run. And um, I showed my students, you know, the first Inconvenient Truth, the first lab of the semester. I'm going to be at a conference in Washington next week, and they will see the sequel to that. And um, we do calculations. The calculations I've done with the class are worse than what you said about the amount of Hiroshima bombs. We came up with about 1,000 per second of the ocean heat that has gone up with the one degree Celsius right, because we're, we're doing that in class. Yeah. I mean First of all, I, I can provide one small uh, bit of help to you. The propane cooktop can be replaced now with these amazing um, induction cooktops uh, uh, that run on electricity and are, but are extremely efficient uh, and quite cheap. Uh, you can get one for 40 or 50 bucks and, and uh, cook anything on it. So uh, look into it. Uh, but uh, thank you enormously for doing that work around solar power. Uh, and I mean, if you can do it in Vermont, you can literally do it any place uh, on the planet. I mean, of course, we also have an enormous good resource here with wind uh, that we're probably not taking full advantage of. That would be good, too. But it's this is what we need to be doing. And thank you very much. <coughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, when's the demonstration at the fall power plants? Oh, yes. And it set me thinking that here in Vermont, GMP serves their peak energy demand with, with distributed storage and Tesla walls. We just got Which we just got. That's good for you. But the power company in New Hampshire refuses to do that. And in the process, it spends Upting more money. Yes. Whatever happened to rationality? Why? Well, utilities. I mean, utility, I've actually written a good deal about utilities for the uh, New Yorker, and I got to say, I interviewed a lot of utility executives, um, including Mary Powell, who I really like. I said the other day when I was introducing her that, in my experience, you could count the number of enlightened utilities.
utility executives in America on the fingers of one finger. Um, <laughs> Uh, and it's really sad news that she's retiring, although apparently she's got a good replacement, another woman. Um, um, the, so if you're a utility, you tend to be locked into, you, you, around the country they've done enormous things to defend their current way of doing things, okay? Because they don't like, none of the incumbent players really like the fact that you could move to a system where people, in essence, didn't have to write a check to someone for their power every month. So if you're Exxon, or if you're an investor on utility or something, what a horrible business model. The sun comes up and provides you power for free, okay? The wind blows and provides, that's, a, if you're used to having people write you a check every month, uh, that's a bad business model. So around the country, Utilities have done, I, I wrote the New Yorker about um, the, the utility in Arizona, which was taking, they found out, ratepayer money and using it to elect candidates to the Public Service Commission that regulated them. And those people once elected to the Public Service Commission put in place a $60 a month tariff on anyone who wanted to put a solar panel on their roof forever. Which meant that Phoenix, which Phoenix is, I mean, they call it the Valley of the Sun. Okay? I mean, no one has ever called this valley the Valley of the Sun. Right? They call it, I mean, the basketball team is called the Phoenix Suns. Okay? College basketball is the Arizona Sun Devils. Yeah? If you fly in an airplane into Phoenix, you hardly see a solar panel. That's why? You know, same in Florida, in the Sunshine State, it's almost impossible to get a, put a solar panel on your roof, so there aren't any. You know. um, if you go to Germany, which put in the feed-in tariff 30 years ago uh, to make it really possible, Germany, where no one has ever gone for a beach vacation in their lives, <laughs> produces more, more of its power from the sun than just about any place on the planet. So, that's what it takes, that, that kind of work. Yes, all over the place. And, and there is a wonderful, wonderful 350 VT, 350 Vermont. There, look, I mean, 350 is just this endless, vast volunteer assemblage. I'm a volunteer, everybody in it's mostly volunteer. 350 Vermont is the local chapter, and they do great work just around those things. Maine is a great example of that. Uh, and, and it's largely because there's a young woman who led the fight to get Harvard to divest its fossil fuel stocks, who's now been elected the state legislator from one of the most conservative and rural parts of Maine, and she's leading the fight. And it's been wonderful to watch that happen. Um, um, change can come, and it needs to come now really fast in these places. So. But it has to be more uh, helpful with cooperation of, of the government. Well, the governments, in my experience, cooperate only to the extent that people more or less make them cooperate. Uh, Bill, on that note there, Rochester being the heart of Vermont, this Monday night on the Select Board agenda is the discussion of climate emergency declaration. This only works as voters come out and have a discussion. This is our opportunity in our town to speak to Vermont how we feel about all this. Good. And once you declare a climate emergency, send a letter off to Montpelier saying, now can we divest our holdings and so, we, so we don't make this problem worse you know, each day. That's great. Thank you. I, the first solar panel actually was at the St. Louis World's Fair, uh, the same fair that brought us both the ice cream cone and the hot dog. So there you are. Um, and, and the real first, the, the, the as not uncommonly, the, the place where they actually really developed them was in the space program um, because they needed a source of power. And they were, and, and of course, you know, at NASA, the fact that it was incredibly expensive didn't matter because there was, they had no alternative for generating power. And, and so that's where they first started developing. And, and there was a kind of brief heyday of them, you're right, after the uh, uh, after the first oil shock, and 
Jimmy Carter, bless his heart, put solar panels on the roof of the White House. Now I can tell you what happened with the rest of that story. Okay? Uh, the oil industry didn't, actually did not like that. And as soon as Ronald Reagan was elected, he took down the solar panels from the White House. Now I went and found the solar panels that had been on the roof of the White House. They moved them to, uh, they, when they took down a professor at a tiny college in central Maine, a place called Unity College, uh, collected these solar panels that had been on the roof of the White House and took them to Maine and put them on the roof of the dining hall in this college. And so early on in the Obama administration, I went up and asked if we could have, they were now, you know, they, they'd gotten some new ones. I said, we have these historical relics and we'll take them back to Washington and give them as a gift to President Obama in an effort to see if he'll put them on the roof. And we did. We had a great uh, four or five day uh, sort of extravaganza dragging them down from Maine and we stopped and did big uh, uh, events in New York and Baltimore and Boston and whatever. And we finally got them to the White House and the Obama administration which at least in the beginning was not very big on dealing with climate change, she said, no, thank you, we don't want them. Um, but we left them there anyway. Um, 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 finally, at the very end of the Obama administration, they put some solar panels back up. But that's the kind of perfect story of the wasted three decades. You know? um, and it reminds us that it, was, that it wasn't always quite as partisan uh, craziness as it is now. You know? In 1988, when we first really started talking about climate change, George H.W. Bush was running for president, and he said, I will fight the greenhouse effect with the White House effect, which was a good line. 30 years later, after 30 years of dedicated lying by the fossil fuel industry, you know, we have a current, the current Republican president announces over and over again that Climate change is a hoax manufactured by the Chinese. A position odd enough that, I mean, if you were sitting on the Greyhound bus and the person next to you began muttering it, you would look around for a that's, that's where we are now. And I will say, it did give me great pleasure today, along with seeing the picture of Greta uh, standing up against the Keystone Pipeline, to see a picture of uh, Jimmy Carter uh, swaddled in bandages from the fall he took yesterday at a, at a Habitat for Humanity house, putting up a house with the solar panel on the roof. So uh, history works in all kinds of interesting cycles. There we are. It's kind of you to say, um, um, I, I spend more time uh, sort of kicking myself for not figuring out some of it earlier and getting to work. But it is, I will say, as you work on all of this, just know that you have an enormous number of brothers and sisters around the world who are working on it. And now we can kind of see them coming out in their millions around the planet, marching and getting involved. And it's, um, it's always sobering to me that so many of them are in places that did not cause the problem. You know? uh, and if they can get up, you know, there were pictures coming in the other day during the climate strikes uh, the first pictures I saw were from the Solomon Islands. It was young people in canoes arriving on the main island for the demonstration. And there were pictures, pretty big demonstrations in Bangladesh, where I've been. Uh, Bangladesh, if there's any country on earth, it's going to be, it already is. And there's millions of people have had to leave their farms along the coastal edges. To, you know, if they're, if they're willing to kind of join with the rest of us in this work of trying to stay, it kind of moves me all the time. So it's really good to be in another room filled with people who I know are working on this, and I'm really grateful for it. And just to say, um, give it another good shove, you know, um, in the next next little while, because the next little while is, in fact, the time that we have. So.